The question is often asked, how to bring the practice into daily life? And the best way to answer it is to switch the priorities around. Take the question, how to bring daily life into your practice? In other words, you want your practice to create the context, to create the frame. And then you allow certain parts of your daily life in. It's an important lesson in realizing how much your mind shapes your environment. All too often we let our mind be shaped by what's around us, but we want to make that environment. The media come at us in such force that it's often hard to realize that we should be in charge of our environment what we take in, what we don't take in, and what we put into our environment. You start with the precepts. You want to hold to the precepts no matter what. And don't let the, word <coughs> don't let the world tell you that there are reasons for breaking the precepts. Sometimes they'll trot out fear of loss of wealth, loss of health, or the anger of your relatives. But as the Buddha said, those kinds of loss are not really serious. You lose them and you can get them back. The serious losses are loss of your virtue and loss of right view. If you lose those, it's going to be a long time before you can get them back. So you don't want the four types of bias to influence you. In other words, you don't break the precepts for somebody's sake because you like them and want to please them. You don't break, <clears throat> you don't break the precepts because they're people you don't like and you want to treat them unfairly. You don't want to break them out of delusion. And you don't want to break them out of fear, fear of somebody's power. You've got to hold to them. Remember, you're trying to hold to precepts that are pleasing to the noble ones. If you're going to please anybody in your observance of the precepts, try to please them, because they themselves have held by the precepts and have seen that they really are advantageous. So think of the noble ones watching over your shoulder. This is where you bring in the principles of shame and compunction. The word shame has gotten bad press in, in the West for a long time now. But you have to remember there are two kinds of shame. Unhealthy shame, which is the opposite of pride, and then healthy shame, which is the opposite of shamelessness. And the Buddha, of course, is advocating healthy shame. A shameless person doesn't care what other people think, even the best people in the world. They don't care what those people think. But if you're wise, you want to keep the standards of the noble ones in mind. And you find that a lot of these principles for bringing the world into your practice require just that, mindfulness. In this case, you're keeping the standards of the noble ones in terms of your precepts. And it carries over to the next principle which is restraint of the senses, being really careful, careful about how you engage with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, and ideas. Realizing again that your mind is what goes out and looks for things. If the mind were not actively involved in wanting to see and hear and engage with other senses, it wouldn't have any input. It's an act of the mind that goes out to these things, it flows out to these things, as they would say in time. And you wouldn't watch that. Who's flowing out? Your greed? Your anger? Or your discernment? You want your discernment to be the strongest flow, so that when you look at things you can take them apart and see where they 
might draw you into lust, or anger, or greed, or fear. And remind yourself, you don't have to be drawn in that way. Again, have a sense of your own power. Don't let yourself be overpowered by the influences from outside. So in sensory input is not a given. Remember that it's a construct. There's the karma of how you watch, the karma of how you listen, and so on. So you want to look at one, the intention, and then two, the result. And then in line with the principle that the Buddha taught to Rahula, if you see that the way you engage is causing trouble, causing harm to yourself, can you go back and figure out what's a different way of looking, what's a different way of listening? Because if you just keep on exercising your greed and your other defilements as you engage with the senses, they're going to get strong. And when they're strong, then they're going to move in on your, your meditation. So remember, as you go through the day engaging the senses, you're practicing meditation. You have to have that same vigilance over what your mind is doing, where it's going, and where it's coming from. That you would as you're sitting here with your eyes closed. Another important principle for bringing the world into your practice is restraining your conversation. As the Buddha says, moderation in your conversation. Remember John Fung's comment that if something is not necessary, why say it? Get some control over your mouth. And then think of the Buddhist standards for saying things. One, it would have to be true. Two, it would have to be beneficial. And then three, you have to be the right time and place to say pleasing things, and there's a right time and place to say displeasing things. And here again, don't let your fear of other people get in the way of your sense of what is the right time and place to talk to them in those ways. Because what you talk about as you go through the day is going to be reverberating in your mind as you sit down to meditate. So be careful about what you say. If you treat your words as if they have value, in other words, hand them out slowly, hand them out in a parsimonious way, other people will begin to value them as well. It was just one big flood of words that goes on and on and on. After all, it means nothing. People don't value it. So show that you value your words. And you find that other people will listen more carefully. And at the same time, your speech again becomes an influence on your meditation. what the Buddha calls verbal fabrication. You're engaging in verbal fabrication all the time, directed thought and evaluation. And then you'll be bringing those two habits, or those two skills, into your concentration. So make sure they're well trained before you apply them to concentration. And you'll find that your practice will go a lot more smoothly. The fourth principle is seclusion. You've got to find time to be off by yourself, away not only from other people but also from your devices. Being able to look at your own mind so you're not constantly subject to the chatter from outside and the allure of things from outside, but just get to see the mind on its own terms. You want to keep in touch with that day after day after day as much as you can, so you can keep your grounding. And remind yourself that seclusion is the context. When the Buddha talks about seclusion, it's not just physical seclusion. He also talks about mental seclusion, when you're secluded from your defilements. secluded from unskillful states. In other words, when you get the mind into concentration, so 
So it can watch itself on its own terms. You can watch the body in and of itself, feelings in and of themselves, mind in and of itself, dhammas in and of themselves. Because you're going to get, have to be really familiar with these things, because when death comes, this is what you'll be dealing with. And you want to be able to deal with it on these terms. In other words, the body in the context of the body, and not the body in the context of the world and the narrative about how this body is going to have to die and leave the world. Your feelings, again, in the context of feelings, not in the context of the world. This is why I said you want to make sure that the practice forms the context. Because as you maintain this context, you're in touch with your refuge. You keep yourself safe because it helps you see things in terms of their their true nature, what's really important, what's only of secondary importance. And when you don't allow the narratives of the world to come and get in the way, then the mind is going to be a lot more stable and a lot more secure. This then, of course, connects with the the last of the principles, which is right view. You start with the right view about karma and rebirth in general. Thinking about what those principles say about your life. If you say life ends with death and that's it, there's nothing more, then it's going to put everything else in your daily life into one context. But if you think about this as something that's going to lead on for more and more and more lives, then your actions take on a different meaning. And you want to keep that context in mind so that you can have a clear idea of what really is worth doing, what's not worth doing. When you start getting attached to ideas, memories, material things. You, have to, you can remind yourself, okay, you've had these things before, and you've, had, you've let go of them before, and you come back to them again, and you miss them again. And haven't you had enough? Because if you think life ends with, everything ends with death, there's no sense of enough. You want to grab as much as you can before you go. But if you realize that you're going to keep coming back, and back, back, back again. And you've been through this many, many times. And what do you have to show for it? As the Buddha said, more tears than there's water in the ocean. So keep that larger context in mind. What this comes down to, of course, is those first three principles. Following the precepts, restraint in terms of your speech, restraint of the senses, those come under virtue, training and heightened virtue. Seclusion comes under training and heightened mind or concentration. The right view comes in training and heightened discernment. So you're taking this triple training, and you're taking the context of this training, you're making this the framework of your life. And then you can judge which parts of the life as you've been living it so far fit into that and which ones don't. You can sort things out that way. In some cases, it's going to require some radical changes in how you've been living, but it's all to the good. Because when you put everything in the context of the practice, then what you do and say and think, even when you're not meditating, becomes part of the development of your perfections. Those qualities that sustain us. and that lead to the further shore. So put your daily life in the right context, and your actions will take on a new meaning. They're not pulling off in different directions, but they head toward a happiness that you really want, that's really worth wanting as long as you keep your priorities straight.